Welcome to a new deep dive. Today, we're taking on, well, a pretty huge topic. Huge is right. We're tracing the entire story of mathematics. I mean, from the very, very first ways people counted stuff. Like actual sticks and stones. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All the way up to uh, quantum computers, yeah. stuff that's happening right now. We've pulled together quite a stack of sources, you know, ancient records, historical accounts, biographies, really trying to get the full picture. Mm -hmm. The goal here is sort of map out how each big idea built on the last one. And crucially, why this whole story is, well, it's definitely not finished yet. Let's get into it. Yeah, it's a fantastic journey through human ingenuity, really, from counting sheep, essentially, to these incredibly abstract algorithms. And what strikes me is just how universal this drives is. You know, to measure, to understand patterns, it pops up everywhere, across all of time. Right. And you, listening, you're basically joining us on this trip through time, following these amazing threads. OK, so let's start way back, like really early days. Imagine a time before writing, even. How did people keep track of things? More than they could just count on their hands. Well, the evidence points to really simple tools. Notched bones, pebbles in a bag, marks on clay, things like that. It's physical counters? Exactly. But then around 2500 BC, things get a bit more complex, especially for uh, Sumerian merchants. They needed to handle bigger numbers for trade. And this practical need, it seems, led directly to the abacus. The very first one we know of, anyway could be as early as 2700 BC. Wow. That early? Yeah, one historian actually calls it the earliest known computing device, just beads on rods, fundamentally. And that simple idea, sliding beads for adding and subtracting, it just took off, didn't it? It really did. You see versions pop up everywhere. The Chinese Swan Pan, Roman Abbasi, they're all descendants. And it's not just about adding. That sliding bead thing, that's kind of the birth of place value, isn't it? The idea that where a digit is changes its value. Precisely. That's the bedrock, why a 1 in 10 is different from the 1 in 100. It all goes back to those early accountants and their beats. Okay, so moving forward maybe uh, 500 years or so to around 2000, 1800 BC, we start seeing really sophisticated math recorded, Mesopotamia or Babylon. On clay tablets, right, with that wedge-shaped cuneiform writing. Mm -hmm. And then they weren't just counting. They had multiplication tables, geometry. They even knew about Pythagorean triples. Which is kind of amazing, that famous tablet, Plimpton 322, mm -hmm. from around 1800 BC. Yeah, that one's fascinating. It lists whole number solutions to a squared plus b squared equals c squared you know, like three, four, five, which means they understood the relationship in right angle triangles centuries before Pythagoras. Right, which makes you wonder just how common was this kind of knowledge? It wasn't just Babylon either. We've got sources like the Egyptian Orion mathematical papyrus around 1650 BC and the Moscow papyrus too. They show pretty advanced arithmetic geometry, stuff they needed for building, for surveying land after the Nile floods, for astronomy. Yeah, building pyramids definitely requires some serious geometry. Absolutely. And the Egyptians also developed really complex ways of handling fractions for trade. Meanwhile, over in China, by 1000 BC. They already had a decimal system <laughs> and negative numbers. Yep, a place value decimal system. And yeah, the concept of negative numbers. So you see these parallel developments happening all over the ancient world. People figuring out the language of numbers independently. OK, so up to this point, it's mostly about practical calculation, right? Building things, trading things. Largely, yes, though astronomy played a big role, too. But then we get to the Greeks around the 6th century BC. Yeah. And things change fundamentally. Big time. This is where math transforms into what they called a demonstrative science. It becomes about proof about logical certainty. The Pythagoreans even coined the word mathema, meaning what is learned. They wanted structure, logic. And their influence is just immense. You can't talk about this without mentioning Euclid, his book, Elements Around 300 BC. It's basically the blueprint for mathematical thinking for centuries. Yeah, people call it the most influential textbook ever. Probably is. Definitions, axioms, theorems, proofs, all laid out systematically. And this focus on proof is the key thing. Euclid didn't just state facts, he proved them. Like proving there are infinitely many prime numbers. Exactly. Or Archimedes figuring out the geometry of spheres, circles, apparently shouting Eureka in the bath. <laughs> Maybe apocryphal, but the math was real. And Apollonius working on conic sections, Re you know, ellipses, parabolas, shapes that turn out to be crucial for physics later on. What's incredible is they built this whole axiomatic system, start with basic truths, use logic to prove everything else, all without the algebraic symbols we use today. It was mostly geometry. So math wasn't just about getting the right answer anymore. No, it was about proving why the answer was right. A system of undeniable truths, huge leap. 
Now, while things slowed down a bit mathematically in Roman and medieval Europe, other parts of the world were making massive strides, India especially. Right, this is where zero comes in. Yes. Around the 5th or 6th century AD, Indian mathematicians invent the numeral for zero. And crucially, they developed the full decimal place value system we use today, the numbers zero through nine. The Hindu Arabic numerals, which seems like such a basic thing now, but it completely revolutionized calculation, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. Imagine doing long division with Roman numerals. These new numerals, refined by scholars like Brahmagupta, eventually made their way west. Through the Islamic world, right, al khwarizmi yeah, Exactly. al khwarizmi working in Baghdad during the Islamic Golden Age around the 8th to 12th centuries, he wrote foundational texts using these numerals. And his work on equations gave us the word algebra from al-jab, meaning something like restoring or completion. So they weren't just transmitting Indian ideas, they were building on them. And on the Greeks, too. Massively. Solving quadratic and cubic equations, developing trigonometry, preserving Greek texts that might have been lost. Baghdad was a major center of learning. And it wasn't just those regions, either. China was still advancing. Maya culture had its own sophisticated calendar math, including zero. Mm -hmm. And Persian and Arab scholar astronomers were doing amazing work blending algebra and astronomy. So you've got all these streams converging, Greek logic, Indian numerals and zero, Islamic algebra and preservation. Exactly. All feeding into what would become this explosion of activity in Renaissance Europe. The stage was set. And the Renaissance really delivered on that promise. Yeah. Rediscovering those Greek texts, plus this new spirit of scientific inquiry. Boom. Yeah, the pace picks up dramatically. Then fast forward to the 17th century, you get René Descartes. Uh-huh. I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> but also... Coordinate geometry. That's the one. Brilliantly linking algebra and geometry, suddenly you could describe shapes with equations and equations with shapes, a huge breakthrough. But maybe the biggest leap of this era, calculus. Oh, definitely. Independently invented by Isaac Newton in England and Gottfried Leibniz in Germany around the same time, 1660s, 1670s. Newton called it his science of flexions. Right. It gave them and us the tools to finally describe change mathematically. Motion, acceleration, growth rates, gravity, everything that wasn't static. It's kind of hard to overstate how revolutionary calculus was. And historians note, after this, the pace of discovery just goes into overdrive. Absolutely. You get Euler in the 18th century, just pouring out theorems, standardizing notation we still use, applying calculus everywhere, especially physics. You can almost feel the momentum building. Pascal and Fermat figuring out probability. Which becomes the basis for statistics. Napier mm. inventing logarithms to simplify calculations. Which were essential for astronomy and navigation. Then Lagrange, Laplace, refining mechanics, predicting planetary motion. By the end of the 18th century, math is undeniably the engine driving the scientific revolution. It's the language of the universe, basically. Okay, so moving into the 19th century. This is often seen as the era of, like, pure math really coming into its own. And some real giants emerge. Definitely. Carl Friedrich Gauss, for instance, German mathematician, active in the first half of the century. His work spanned everything, number theory, astronomy, statistics, geometry. He saw connections everywhere. Isn't there that story about him as a kid summing numbers from 1 to 100? Oh, yeah. The classic anecdote. Teacher gives the class busy work, add up 1 to 100. Gauss supposedly figures out you can pair them up, 1 plus 100, 2 plus 99, etc., all adding to 101. There are 50 pairs. So 50 times 101, 50-50. Done in seconds. While well, everyone else is still adding, probably made him popular. But it shows that innate pattern recognition. Exactly. And he was just one towering figure. Who else was really pushing boundaries then? Well, there's Everest Galois in France. His life was tragically short died in a duel at 20. Incredible. But in that short time, he laid down the foundations of group theory, which is all about symmetry and structure. Hmm. Super abstract, but incredibly powerful. And Bernhard Riemann in Germany, he took geometry in totally new directions, thinking about curved spaces, a work that was absolutely essential for Einstein's theory of relativity later on. And it's also inspiring that against really significant barriers, women started making their mark. Sophie Germain earlier, than Sofia Kovalevskaya. Right, breaking into a field that was almost entirely male-dominated. So this whole century, it's just buzzing with new ideas. Abstract algebra, non-Euclidean geometry, challenging Euclid, complex numbers getting a solid footing, defining things like limits and continuity with real rigor. Yeah, laying the groundwork for so much of 20th century mathematics. And as all this theoretical math is happening, 
something else is brewing. Right. The idea of actually automating calculation. Right. Back to machines. Charles Babbage, in the 1830s in England, he designed these incredible machines, the difference engine, then the analytical engine. Mechanical computers, basically. Powered by steam. Conceptually, yes. The analytical engine even had features like conditional branching, loops, memory, things we recognize in modern computers. And Ada Lovelace worked with them. She's often called the first programmer. Mm -hmm. She wrote what's considered the first algorithm intended to be processed by a machine specifically for Babbage's analytical engine calculating Bernoulli numbers. Even though the machines were never fully built in their lifetime. No, they were too complex for the engineering of the time. But the ideas were incredibly influential. They planted the seed. Okay, so fast forward almost a century. We get to the 20th century, and mathematicians start thinking about computation in a much more abstract, formal way. What is an algorithm, fundamentally? And that leads us to Alan Turing. 1936, huge year. He publishes his paper describing the Turing machine. Which isn't really a physical machine, right? It's a theoretical model. Exactly. A simple, abstract device tape, symbols, rules but it captures the essence of what it means to compute algorithmically. The father of computer science. Often called that, yes. Yeah. And his work also proved something profound, that there are mathematical problems that cannot be solved by any algorithm, by any computer, limits to computation. So how does this theory turn into the machines we know? Well, World War II was a massive catalyst. The need for code-breaking Turing himself was central to cracking the German Enigma code at Bletchley Park. Right. And the need for complex calculations for things like artillery trajectories. This spurred the development of the first large-scale electronic computers, like ENIAC in the US. Built with vacuum tubes taking up whole rooms. Huge things. But they worked. And after the war, the technology just spread like wildfire. Suddenly, mathematicians and scientists could tackle problems that were completely intractable by hand. But behind the machines, even the early electronic ones, there were still people doing critical calculations. Which brings us to Katherine Johnson. Ah, yes, an incredible story. An African-American woman working at NASA initially as a human computer in the segregated South. Her calculations were absolutely vital for the Mercury, Apollo, even space shuttle programs. Yeah. Yeah, the source mentions she loved counting from a young age. Mm -hmm. Just counted everything. Skipped grades, went to college incredibly young, often the only black woman facing bias. Mm -hmm. And yet her talent shone through. A professor apparently created a special advanced math class just for her. Her work on orbital mechanics, launch windows, emergency return paths, it was critical. John Glenn famously asked for her to personally recheck the electronic computer's trajectory calculations before his Friendship 7 flight. Wow. Talk about trust. It really highlights that human element, doesn't it? The passion, the perseverance behind the numbers. It's not just cold logic. Absolutely. And that continues today. You look at modern mathematicians, people like the late Maria Mirzakhani, the first woman to win the Fields Medal, working on complex geometry, or Terence Tao, Cedric Villani. They're driven by that same curiosity, pushing boundaries. And it's not only pure mathematicians. Think about Nobel Prize winners in science. Their work often rests on a mathematical foundation. Richard Feynman, the physicist. Right, famous for quantum electrodynamics, path integrals. Brilliant physicist. But he also, back in the early 80s, started thinking about computation in a completely new way. He was one of the pioneers asking, what if we use quantum mechanics itself to compute. Which brings us right to the cutting edge, quantum computing. Exactly. Mm. Feynman realized that classical computers really struggle to simulate quantum systems accurately. They just get overwhelmed. Because quantum mechanics is inherently weird and complex. Things can be in multiple states at one superposition, and particles can be linked across distances entanglement. Classical bits, zeros and ones, just can't capture that efficiently. So Feynman proposed using quantum systems themselves, atoms, photons to do the computing, using their quantum properties, like qubits that can be zero, one, or both at the same time. A mind-bending idea. But where does the math come back in so strongly? Well, for a while it was a fascinating theoretical idea. But then, in 1994, Peter Shore, a mathematician at Bell Labs... Ah, Shore's algorithm. Exactly. He came up with a quantum algorithm that could, theoretically, factor large numbers incredibly fast exponentially faster than any known algorithm for a classical computer. Okay, pause there. Why is factoring large numbers such a big deal? Because almost all modern encryption, 
the stuff protecting your bank account online, your emails, secure websites, uses RSA encryption. Right, relies on the fact that it's really hard for classical computers to factor the huge numbers used in the keys, takes practically forever. But Shor's algorithm showed that a quantum computer, if you could build a big enough, stable enough one, could potentially break that encryption relatively easily. In polynomial time, not exponential. Game changer. Suddenly, quantum computing wasn't just a physicist's dream, it was a potential threat to global cybersecurity. Exactly. So that discovery really kicked research into high gear. Governments, tech companies pouring billions into building quantum hardware. Trying to control these incredibly delicate quantum states, using lasers, microwave pulses, keeping things near absolute zero. It's still early days for large-scale, fault-tolerant machines. The current ones are pretty noisy and limited. But the theory is solid. And it's forcing us to rethink everything from cryptography, developing new post-quantum methods, to fundamental questions about computational complexity. What is truly hard and what might be easy for a different kind of machine? So here we are, from counting pebbles to Euclid's proofs to Newton's calculus to Turing's limits and now quantum algorithms. It's quite a journey. It really is. Each step building on what came before. From those elegant Greek proofs, to David Hilbert laying out his famous 23 problems in 1900 that guided so much 20th century math. To today's big unsolved questions like the Riemann hypothesis or PVSNP, the quest continues. And you see these mathematical ideas weaving through absolutely everything. Science, technology, art, economics. It's the hidden structure. And driven by remarkable people, Euclid, Newton, Gauss, Shor, but also Al-Khwarizmi, Lovelace, Johnson, Mirzakhani, so many contributors adding their piece to this incredible tapestry. We really hope this deep dive has uh, sparked some curiosity for you, maybe shown math in a different light. Yeah, so maybe the takeaway for you listening is this. Math history is basically a story of problem solving and finding new ways to see the world. Given how much it's evolved and how much is still unknown, where might you see mathematical thinking making a difference? In your work, your interests, it's worth considering. Keep exploring, keep asking questions, because this story, the story of mathematics, it's definitely not over.